we're going to get started and go through the agenda very quickly and tell you guys what we're going to try to cover uh, today. And then we're, from there, we're going to jump right on the microscope and we'll go back and, 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 and go through some other details. So the first thing we're going to do this morning is go through what the key system features are of the microscope system that we're working with or inside of the system. We're going to quickly transition to a live microscope demonstration where we have nanoparticles on the cells on the microscope. And then we're going to demonstrate an optical image immediately of gold nanoparticles in the HeLa cells. We're going to capture a hyperspectral imaging image of that sample. And we're going to provide a spectral comparison. We're going to look at nanoparticle spectrum versus cell structure spectrum. And then we're going to demonstrate just one of the features of hyperspectral imaging analysis, and that's the ability to conduct spectral mapping of nanoparticles themselves. So we're going to go to the microscope first and do that. We're going to show you how it works. Then we're going to come back uh, to the PowerPoint deck and spend just a few minutes actually discussing the, the optics from both an enhanced dark field perspective and hyperspectral imaging perspective, so you have a sense of how it works. Then after we complete that, we're gonna look at some additional examples in what I'll call the nanobio interface, uh, specifically around uh, silver nanoparticles and bacteria. We're gonna look at some polystyrene plastic and tissue uh, and some other things that you see there. And then once we complete that, um, we'll have a quick uh, question and answer session uh, as, we, as we finish. So with that, I'm going to now see if we can go to the microscope. And so we've got a live feed, as you can see here, of the, uh, of the microscope, and we have a sample already on the microscope image. So this is a sample, as I mentioned earlier, from uh, Dr. Mutha Pakwasami's lab at Concordia University. Uh, in Montreal, Canada. And Dr. Pakrasami and his group uh, acquired uh, the site of even enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscope uh, a few years ago and had been publishing some fantastic papers looking at plasmonic nanoparticle cell interaction. And so this is one of their samples from one of their papers that we published, and we'll uh, provide some details on this paper a little bit later on. But we wanted you to see. And so one of the things that I'm going to do here, this is actually, I'm actually, I, 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 we don't have a, uh, we don't have a very secure platform with the microscopes on this point. So as I bump the platform, you can actually see the, uh, the sample moving a little bit here at, at 100x. So this is an, a live image of the dark field, uh, dark field side of Viva. One of the things that uh, we wanted to do really quickly with the live image is just take you through, and we're going to actually change the z-axis plane so that we're going to be above the sample at 100x. And as the sample goes completely out of focus, we're going to very quickly move, to, excuse me, very slowly move back up into the sample and focus the sample so that you can see the cells and the nanoparticles as they, as they come in focus manually in, in the Z profile here as we're coming in. So you can see now the cell coming into focus and nanoparticles coming into focus. What you see here on the screen, you can see in dark field mode with these HeLa cells, you can see the outline, the faint outline of the nuclear membrane of the cells. And so endosomal uh, cytoplasmic areas of the cell are, of course, outside of the nuclear membrane and the nuclear here. So I believe these samples actually have. Uh, a DAPI uh, nucleic acid label on it. But in the pure dark field mode, we're not going to see these uh, these DAPI labels very well. But that's, that's not the focus of what we're doing here today. The idea is the ability to quickly illustrate for you that nanoparticles are present principally all throughout the, I'll call the cytoplasmic area of the cell. I'm not, I'm not a cell biologist, so I won't try to name all of those parts. And you see nanoparticles that look like, in some cases, that they are uh, aggregating or, or coming around maybe the nuclear membrane. Uh, in this paper, they, they actually talk about the potential for some of the smallest nanoparticles uh, maybe crossing the nuclear membrane, but you can read about that in the paper. One of the things that 
you'll notice about this sample is that, of course, these cells, even though they're fixed, these HeLa cells have lots of z-axis profile and, and depth. And so as, as we actually continue to focus up and down in this sample, you, you'll be able to see nanoparticles that come in focus and other nanoparticles that go out of focus. And it seems like that the cell that we're looking at at about 10 o'clock in the image may actually produce best data with regard to that. So we're actually going to zoom in, if I can capture that here, zoom in on that cell and take a real quick look at that, okay? And so we're at 100X and we're zoomed in significantly here. And what I really want to show you is, is that as we focus in and out of the Z focal plane, you can see nanoparticles come in and out of focus, which is a really significant indicator that these nanoparticles are not just on the cell structure, but we actually have internalization of some of these nanoparticles uh, in the cell itself, okay? Which is one of the significant features of this technology is the ability to demonstrate not only that you have cells and nanoparticles, in the field of view, but it can provide insight as to how these nanoparticles can be internalized. So, now, with the 100x objective, you've got a focal depth of approximately 200 nanometers in the z-axis, so you have a very shallow focal depth, which provides this opportunity to section through the cell quite effectively. Now, one of the things that we, we've done at Sadiviva based on, on customer feedback to try to take advantage of that is create a 3D capability. In effect, we'll call it dark field confocal for easy nomenclature. And our intention is to have a, a follow on webinar that will focus on this 3D uh, cell nanoparticle imaging capability at a later date. We just wanted to mention that as we're showing you this image of nanoparticles in cells and going in different focal points in and out, okay? So with that, I'm actually going to uh, minimize the window for the optical uh, image capture capability, and we're gonna move to the hyperspectral image capture capability, okay? And so the first thing you're going to see with hyperspectral uh, image capture capability is a, is a GUI where we can do image capture. So with dark field hyperspectral imaging, we're able to capture an image to show you the optical spectral response in every pixel of the image, okay? So if we want to capture this line scan hyperspectral image, uh, the software is going to need some data to be able to do that. The first thing it's going to need to know is what the magnification is that we're using. As we mentioned earlier, we're using a 100x magnification of the image. This is so we can get pixels square, et cetera. It wants to know what the exposure setting is, and we know for this sample that we need an exposure setting of approximately 0.15 seconds per pixel row that is captured of exposure, and we need a file name, okay? So we're gonna call this uh, file name, we'll call this number one, and these are AUNPs and HeLa cells, okay? So we've got that data. Now, it wants to know how big of an image that we want to capture off the center of the field of view that we looked at earlier in the optical image capture. So for purposes of the webinar today, to be fast, we're not gonna capture a full field of view. A full field of view would be 700 pixels by 700 pixels. But in this case, we're gonna capture 700 pixels by 200 pixels, 200 pixels off the center of the field of view. So we've completed that, and now we're going to actually do a preview, a live preview of the data. The uh, diffraction grading spectrograph that's mounted on the camera C-mount um, actually uh, has a slit, has a 30 micron slit, where the live feed from the microscope is being projected through the slit onto a diffraction grading spectrograph, the detector, and our live feed that we see here. And so you can see the data being projected live onto the screen. And the primary purpose for looking at the preview screen is to know that you've got good exposure setting and that you've got uh, a, a good focus, uh, par focal from uh, the microscope up to the camera. And so with a dynamic range on this camera from zero to 16,000, we wanna make sure that we don't have quenching. 
So where we have values, uh, spectral values of about 2,000 in the, in the y-axis, that's a good indicator to us that we're not quenching data, but yet we've got, got good strong signals. So we're going to actually capture a hyperspectral image. And the first thing it wants us to do is turn the light off to the camera so we can capture a, a dark current, which we're going to do. And then we're going to actually look into the microscope eyepiece and check focus to make sure that it's nice and focused. Now we're going to open the aperture of the microscope back up and we're going to capture an image. So we're capturing lots of data and we're going to talk about this in the hyperspectral image at this time. In every pixel of the image that we're capturing, we're capturing the full vis near infrared spectral data from 400 nanometers to 1000 nanometers in every pixel. So pixel sizes with this detector at 100x with 2x binning that we're doing here this morning, the uh, pixel size is going to be at approximately 128 nanometers. Okay, so all of that data is going to be in every one of these, um, every one of these pixels that we're capturing. Okay, and so you can already see here in the uh, in the left hand bottom left hand corner of the image capture that we're at 115 of 200 pixel rows that we're capturing. Here in the left screen is actually a live preview of the data as it's running, as the, as the translational stage, the automated stage is moving sample across the field of view of the spectrograph and camera. And then over to the right is an actual unprocessed view of the image as it's being created that you can see here. Okay. And so we're on line 180. You can see we capture this data very quickly relative to other spectral imaging techniques that you may be using. Okay, and so the data has been captured here, and the software automatically opens the image for us, right? And so once the image is opened, we immediately can see spectral data represented as an RGB, a red, green, blue representation of, of, the, uh, of the sample that we were looking at earlier. Now, it's really interesting that this hyperspectral image looks a lot like the live feed that you saw from the color optical camera image that we were looking at earlier. And that's the whole point. I, I think you, you would say that while this is a spectral measurement tool, it, it's, the focus is on imaging, okay? And so it's the ability to see the spectral data in context that's really important. So. One of the things we're going to do here, we're going to actually go to this zoom window where we have nanoparticles in the zoom window. And you can see what appear to be nanoparticles and cell structure. So we're going to right click on the zoom window and you see some features here. But the feature that we're going to look at is what we call the Z profile spectrum. Now, earlier when we were talking, we referred to Z profile or Z as in Z spatial, up and down in the image as opposed to X and Y on the sample. Here we're going to refer to Z as Z spectral, not Z spatial, meaning behind every pixel is the spectral response for that pixel, okay? So I clicked on that and we see a spectral response and you can see it here. As we go to pixel to pixel, you see different spectrum appearing, okay? So what I want to do now is I'm on an area where we know from working with this sample that we have gold nanoparticles or a gold nanoparticle area. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to collect spectrum because what I want to do is, is compare the spectrum of the gold versus an area of the cell that doesn't appear to have any gold there. And so we see some significant differences in the spectrum between those two areas that we captured, right? You go over to another area that appears to be gold, another area that appears to be cell, and you see there's some really common characteristics between the two gold areas and between the two cell areas, okay? The first thing that you noticed is, is that on one of the gold particles, we had a really high relative signal amplitude of almost 4,000, as opposed to about 800 on the cell structure, right? Which makes perfect sense if you think about plasmonic uh, nanoparticle scattering. And the intensity of that scattering being significantly more than what you would expect 
from uh, from the cell structure itself. Okay, and so you look notice here with the second gold particle that we clicked on in the in the, uh, in the window, we got significantly less scatter, which would indicate probably that that gold particle is on a different focal plane. It's probably buried a little bit deeper uh, in the cell structure. And so the cell structure is obscuring that uh, spectrum and the plasmonic scatter a little bit of that gold particle as opposed to the first one that we clicked on. And, and indeed, it didn't look quite as bright. So maybe uh, on, a, on a slightly different focal plane. But the idea here is to simply show you how easy it is to, one, optically image nanoparticles in cells. It, it's interesting. Uh, myself and, and my colleagues uh, here at Cytobiba, we we have the opportunity to visit with hundreds of, of labs around the world that are involved in nanoparticle uh, synthesis and that are looking at uh, nanoparticle biological interactions every day. And it always never ceases to amaze us that when we set one of these systems up and go into a lab, for example, that may be doing nanodrug delivery, how few of the students in that lab have really ever had a chance to observe their work. These nanoparticles that they're synthesizing, that they may be functionalizing with a drug load, that they're targeting towards cells. It's rare that they ever get to see that on a very frequent basis. With this instrument, it provides you the ability to be able to do that very fast and very easy. And you can see how fast and easy it is to actually create not just an optical image, but a hyperspectral image of that data as well. Now, with a hyperspectral image, there's tons of analysis that you can do. So for example, the analysis that 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 uh, is most common is the one I showed you, where we want to try to just compare spectral data of what appear to be nanoparticles versus cell structure. Now, one of the things that you can do quite easily is that you can actually build a spectral library of, for example, nanoparticles and cells, right? And so if we wanted this to represent a nanoparticle and cell spectral library, we could close this, we'll open it again, and we'll click on it, and we would collect spectrum here, this is one way we can do it, of what appear to be nanoparticles and cells. And we can save that as a spectral library if we want. Once we save that spectral library, though, in order to ensure that, in fact, we do have uh, a spectral library of nanoparticles and cells and not cell structure involved, one of the other things that we can do is we can also conduct spectral filter, right? A feature of the of the uh, of the system that allows us the ability to compare our spectral library that we might build of nanoparticle cells against the control sample that contains no nanoparticles that we know as a result of it of it being a negative control. That's just one of the additional uh, features here of, of this program. So what, what I want to do now, though, is, is actually show you as a final uh, final example in the system how you can conduct mapping. And we're going to actually do this mapping not on the sample that we captured, but one that we captured earlier today here in the lab where we had a, a larger field of view, okay? And you can see this larger field of view here of the same exact sample that we had earlier. And what we want to do is we've created a spectral library for spectral mapping, and we want to conduct that spectral mapping now. We're going to change the way that the spectral data is being presented on the screen here with an enhancement filter. It doesn't change the data. It just changes the way that the data is actually demonstrated. And now we're going to conduct spectral mapping in the software. We're going to use an algorithm called Spectral Angle Mapper, which is an algorithm that's used extensively for hyperspectral imaging. There are dozens of peer-reviewed papers just on the spectral mapping algorithm and how it works. And so on this full image, we're going to conduct the Spectral Angle Mapper algorithm. And now we're going to import a spectral library file that we already have built here, okay? And so here's that spectral library file that we built and already tested against the negative control. These are all of the spectrum that are in that library, and we want them all, okay? And so now we're actually going to do an output classification uh, file. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're querying here all of the spectrum 
in the spectral library against every single pixel in this very large 700 by 700 pixel hyperspectral image that we've got. You notice how quickly that this software is actually running, even on my little slow laptop that I have here this morning that I'm using. And so all of the spectrum here has, has been queried against all of the spectrum of every pixel in this image. And so now we're going to overlay that classification file that we saved as a memory file here, right here, right? And there it is. And so there are all of the pixels in this image that we map as an illustration for demonstrating presence in the location of nanoparticles in the cell structure. So we'll cut the actual uh, uh, cell structure back on sort of in an overlay mode. And then here in the options, we'll merge all of these colors. So we know red is the first color. And so we're going to make them all the same color so we can just see them a little bit better. So now as we turn that signal on and off representing the gold in the cells, we have the ability to map okay, the gold nanoparticles in the cell. And really what we do see is we see gold nanoparticles that in this example are mostly surrounding the nuclear membrane or in the endosomal areas of the cell, et cetera. Okay, showing that. One last feature, and this can be really important if you're looking not at uh, in, in vitro cell culture, but maybe you're looking at ex vivo tissue and you want to know the amount of area that you're mapping for nanoparticles, there is uh, the ability in class distribution here actually produce a report that will actually tell you how many pixels that you're mapping as a percentage of the image. From a relative comparison standpoint, this can be really important. Let's say, for example, that I'm looking at uh, nanoparticle exposure of different amounts of nanoparticles or different types of nanoparticles, and maybe I'm conducting this exposure over different time periods. This class distribution can give you relative feedback on the amount of nanoparticle mapping in case you're doing in cells uh, relative to other times. So it's a great feature. And if you're looking at that with very homogeneous tissue structure, which we're going to show in a little while, it can have even more relevance. Okay. So with that, we're actually going to now move off of the microscope and off of the analysis. And we're going to go back to the PowerPoint uh, presentation and go through the rest of the uh, items that we had here on the agenda today, which are going to be going back through and doing a live detailed uh, technology overview uh, and, uh, and then talking about the technology. So let's take you through this really quickly. So with enhanced dark field hyperspectral imaging, the patented enhanced dark field optics provide a really high signal to noise image so that you can quickly and easily optically detect nanoscale features in a sample. With hyperspectral imaging, we're capturing the optical spectrum in each nanoscale pixel of the image. And then finally, as you saw with the spectral mapping that we did, we can do spectral analysis and spectral mapping quickly of large areas of the sample. Okay, so all of that analysis happened very quickly. So we, we want to mention the sample that we were looking at earlier. We talked about Dr. Pakwasami's group at Concordia, and we're very appreciative of, of the sample that they, that they provided us earlier. We actually use this a lot of times in installations and trainings that we're doing because it's so good. This is an example of the paper that's representative of the sample we used this morning, but we would encourage you to, to uh, go look up other papers from this group. They've done a fantastic job of utilizing this instrument uh, to be able to demonstrate nanoparticle uh, cell interaction and, and cell uptake and some subcellular diagnosis where they're able to actually look at different spectrum of gold nanoparticles in different areas of cells or subcellular localization. Uh, I would mention that Dr. Rebe Rebecca Dresick's group at Rice University has done a lot of extensive work on that, as well as Dr. Devika Chithrani. Uh, uh, who was at Ryerson University uh, when she first started doing that work and has now moved on uh, to another university uh, in, in Canada. So you couldn't really see it uh, in the uh, 
camera feed that we did earlier, but we just wanted to show you what the footprint of the system look like and what some of the components are that make this up. So let's go back and we're going to start at the light source and run through this very quickly with you and then get on to how some of these components work. So if we start with the light source, for the most part with this imaging, we use broadband illumination. Uh, in, the, in the example we were just showing, we're using a halogen illumination, a quartz halogen illumination uh, with um, an aluminum housing. Uh, and we use an aluminum housing on the lamp simply because that takes quartz halogen and it moves all of the near infrared spectrums through to the liquid light guide, which will connect to our enhanced dark field illumination system, which fits in the condenser mount of a standard research grade optical microscope and allows you the ability to create these enhanced dark field optics that we just showed you earlier and that you, um, and that you uh, are able to, to do on the microscope quite easily, okay? So we used a translational stage, an automated stage for the push broom or for the hyperspectral imaging system to push the sample across the field of view of the microscope objectives through to the diffraction grading spectrograph and integrated detector. Okay, so this is a transmission diffraction grading spectrograph. We'll talk about it some more, an integrated detector. We can use different detectors and different uh, spectrographs depending on the application. Uh, in the visible range, we can use CCDs, we can use SCMOS uh, types, and, 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 and on other types of more enhanced sensitivity CCDs. But with really good dark field optics, we reduce the need for using really expensive uh, detectors in a lot of cases uh, with the system, okay? The, the image analysis, image capture software for hyperspectral imaging is a product called Envy that we were looking at a little bit earlier, and it's a highly customized version. There are probably 400,000 seat licenses for Envy in the world. Side of Eva is the only company that's taken Envy and has adopted it and, and modified it for use in the microscope, both in terms of the image capture capability that you looked at a little bit earlier, but also image analysis capability. If we just go back to that really quickly, I want to show you one more thing. We're going to close all the files that we have open here with this and open up one more because one of the things that my colleague mentioned here is that we showed you nanoparticles and cells. We just want to show you what nanoparticles themselves look like uh, in, in solution as well. So those nanoparticles that we looked at earlier, they had a size range according to the publication, I think of about 15 nanometers to about 40 nanometers. But this is an actual hyperspectral image of 50 nanometer gold particles uh, in solution on a microscope slide. And as we right click and go to that Z axis profile spectrum again, okay, we're off in the space here. And we see just noise because we're not on an area of nanoparticles, not much. But as we come up here on a gold particle, you see a very strong plasmonic peak with a very narrow full width half maximum, which again is indicative of the optical spectrum of a nanoparticle, okay, of a gold nanoparticle. And you see the spectrum here, very homogeneous in terms of its peak, some differences in the amplitude, maybe a factor of the focus again, but if we go on an area here where we may have an aggregate, we're going to see what looks like two nanoparticles that are joined together and have become a rod. So if you see this blue spectrum here, we see the main peak seems to shift over here uh, and redshift to, to about 650, or about 100 nanometers redshift, but there's still a shoulder over here at this 560 nanometer wavelength range, which is indicative of the first two. We just wanted to make sure and show you what nanoparticles themselves look like in solution when they're not um, in, the, in a sample in the image. Okay. We want to talk a little bit about the uh, patented uh, enhanced dark field optics, which are really the key to making all of this happen in the system. So these dark field optics were developed at Auburn University. Side of Eva is. Uh, we're located uh, in the research park at Auburn University uh, in the southeast U.S., just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, if you're familiar with the geography, but here in, in the U.S. And these patented dark field optics 
provide some very different performance characteristics versus standard dark field optics that you might get from uh, Olympus or Nikon or uh, Zeiss or other standard microscope uh, companies. And the real difference is how the, uh, the system is, is managed from the light source to the condenser, which you see here. It, this is a, a fairly standard cardioid oil condenser with oil contact, okay? And so what the Side of Eva patented dark field illumination optics do is they manage the light very precisely with liquid light guide, with mirrors, and columnating lenses, so that in effect tries to reshape the geometry of the light to match the geometry of the condenser so that we're able to dramatically improve signal to noise and contrast of dark field over standard dark field. Okay, and so if we try to look at how that manifests itself, this is a paper that was published by a group uh, that's been a long time user of these dark field optics in Korea, where they are conducting microchip electrophoresis. And they've been using uh, these enhanced dark field optics for a number of years and getting these very high signal to noise images, which qualitatively you can see here of their iron oxide nanoparticles in this experiment. But they decided to run an experiment where they would use standard off-the-shelf dark field optics and to compare the two. And so from a qualitative perspective, you can see a dramatic difference in signal to noise, but also quantitatively when they measure that signal to noise versus standard dark field optics, they see about a 10x increase in signal to noise that we measure. So that gives you a sense of how these dark field optics can improve the experience of looking at, in this case, nanoparticles and cells. We want to just briefly provide you some insight on hyperspectral imaging, which you may not be familiar with and how it works. So the hyperspectral imaging system mounts on the C-mount of the microscope. It can operate in the vis near range. It can operate in the short wave infrared range. And in fact, you could have two different hyperspectral imaging systems, one with the CCD or SCMOS on the microscope with a dual port and the SWIR system operating with an in-gas detector. Can capture images like we just showed from 400 to 1,000 nanometers or in the SWIR from 900 to 1,700. And as you saw, pixel sizes can be really small across the array and as small as 128 nanometers. And spectral resolution in the vis near can be very high. We can have spectral resolution as low as two nanometers. And so what that means is, if there's a change in the spectral response from say 500 nanometers, 510 nanometers across the spectral range, where the two nanometer spectral shift, we'll be able to see that absorption or reflection that's happening within that 10 nanometer range fairly easily. And as we showed you already, you can get this data in a very high fidelity, red, green, blue image and do detailed quantitative analysis. Hyperspectral imaging or spectroscopy in general is all about signal to noise of the data that you're trying or the sample that you're trying to image. And the purpose of this slide is just to simply show you again, when you're using the high signal to noise dark field optics, that the fidelity of the spectral data that you get is much improved over standard dark field optics. And uh, as Sam Lawrence, the CEO of Side of Evil, likes to say, this is this is, the, this is the slide that really demonstrates as well as anything uh, the, pow the power of the system. So with that, we're going to now transition very quickly and close, but we want to close by showing some additional examples of how this is used in what we're going to call the nanobio research realm, okay? So we're going to start by showing silver nanoparticles, another plasmonic nanoparticle uh, and we're going to show that uh, interacting with um, bacteria, Bacillus subtilis bacteria in this case. And so here, if you look in this image, and we're zoomed up 4x on a 100x image. So this is about a 400x total magnification, similar to what we saw earlier this morning. We can see silver nanoparticles in the field of view. And if we collect the spectrum of those silver nanoparticles, you see the cyan signal here, representative of that. They look blue because it has a peak below 500 nanometers in the blue range, the RGB. If we look at the cell structure from the bacteria, 
we see cell structure that has less amplitude again, but also has a significant shift in the peak. But if we look at nanoparticles and cells that are clearly interacting with each other, we see a spectrum that has a hybrid of the two elements, the nanoparticle and the cell structure. Um, there are a number of research groups that utilize this looking at the antimicrobial effects of silver and uh, looking at uh, a lot of other uh, nanoparticle and, and bacteria interaction uh, type studies that they're involved in. So this next application is one that is really becoming popular, and it's one that we're just now beginning to understand the potential utility of our instrument. And that's looking at nano and microplastic in a wide range of environments. I don't have to tell everyone on this call that it's, it's a really big deal from a research perspective, especially as it relates to environmental toxicology and human exposure toxicology uh, from an anaplastics perspective. This is looking at um, a control tissue, H&E tissue of a mouse, uh, mouse liver. Now, you might, first thing you might ask is why do I see all of the white nanoscale particulate in the control sample. And because of the fixation process or because it's just naturally there in the liver, okay, there are going to be particulates in this liver that are going to maybe look like, from an optical perspective, uh, the polystyrene. However, if we capture a hyperspectral image of a control sample and we measure the spectrum of some of these white uh, particulates, nanoscale particulates, we're going to get a spectral curve here, which is represented by this curve here, mean spectrum. And so we're going to use this control cell because we're going to filter it against another tissue sample from a mouse that has been exposed to polystyrene, nanoscale polystyrene. Now, this mouse, of course, is going to have polystyrene particles, most likely accumulating in the tissue, but they're also going to have the same material as well as the control mouse, right? But we see that we're collecting different spectrum here than what we were collecting in the other. So by creating a spectral library of particulate in the exposed mouse and then filtering that against multiple negative control samples, we're able to build a positive spectral library for positive mapping of polystyrene and liver. Now, because we believe, as, as, as everyone else in science does, that there is no one instrument that provides all of the answers. It's really important to be able to cross-correlate these kinds of things. And so we would recommend cross-correlating this kind of data with other techniques, whether it's destructive techniques such as ICT mass spec, which I believe was done in this experiment which showed the polystyrene, or if you're using Raman. Uh, and and a, another potential webinar that we're discussing for the future we actually have the ability to integrate this capability on top of the Hariba Raman system. Uh, and so you can, sim not simultaneously, but one right after the other, the exact same field of view, collect Raman data and optical hyperspectral data, and you get the benefits of both. We won't go into uh, today on, on this call, but they're, they're plentiful. But if we use the spectral library that we have filtered against the control, we're able to, again, do spectral mapping, of known areas of polystyrene filtered against the control, and there's some areas of this sample that we're not actually mapping. They don't match the spectrum for the polystyrene. Okay, and so this is an example of how you can look at plastics potentially uh, and do the same type of work that we were showing with plasmonic nanoparticles. So we're going to shift and, and, and get off the biological uh, nanobio. Um, focus just a little bit because there's another really important feature as it relates to nanoparticles with this, and that's the ability to look at functionalization of nanoparticles uh, and, and to be able to measure that functionalization potentially at the individual nanoparticle level. So we're going to show another different type of nanoparticle again, polymeric nanoparticles, and we're going to demonstrate the ability to observe spectrally a change in the spectrum based on a small molecule drug or an active pharmaceutical ingredient being added to the nanoparticle. So we have two hyperspectral images here. One is a polymer nanoparticle control 
and the other is the same polymer particle, but this time functionalized uh, with a chemotherapy, uh, therapeutic, uh, small molecule drug, serves as the API. So both of these look similar if you look at them in the microscope. However, and the reason why they do is because they're mostly reflecting back in the visible range, so they appear as white. But if you look at the spectrum of the polymer particle that's been functionalized with the small molecule drug, you see this very distinctive absorption that's occurring in the spectrum exactly where the reflection is occurring on the polymer nanoparticle. Okay, so um, we um, are able to create a spectral library of this effect filter it against the negative control, and then conduct spectral mapping. So theoretically, we have the ability to take these two different nanoparticles, one that is functionalized and one that's not, mix them together, and potentially even count nanoparticles that are functionalized versus nanoparticles that aren't. Even in our software, we have a particle analysis feature in the hyperspectral software that will allow us to do that in a quantitative way from the counting perspective. So we wanted to illustrate that capability. And then we wanted to close with one last capability, and that is looking at quantum dots in neuronal cells. And the reason why we want to do this is with every other nanoparticle we've shown so far, we're looking at nanoparticles that were either producing plasmonic scatter in the case of the silver and the gold, or the polymer, which produces scatter. But these quantum dots are producing emission spectra, okay? And so if you look at these quantum dots that have filled up this, this, uh, this, this neuron here, this is not using spectral mapping, but the quantum dot produces such a strong uh, emission peak that we measure here in the red range. You can see this very strong full width half maximum narrow, narrow peak that's, re that's indicative of the emission of the quantum dot. And you compare that against the cell structure, which of course has very different spectrum. We're able to not just look at scatter from cell structure or scatter from plasmonic nanoparticles or scatter from polymeric, but you can also measure emission spectrum in a wide range of things too, with quantum dots being the, the nanoparticle uh, that, that you most often see that with. Okay. There's some limitations as to how this works. We won't go into all of that, but we wanted to show this as a last example. So we want to close today by just kind of going through what we've done. We've, we've learned how enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscopy can be used for nanoparticle biological interactions, how fast and easy it is to do that. We've looked at multiple different types of nanoparticle samples in different types of biological environments. And that was our primary focus. One of the things we want you to know is, is that if you have samples and you have some interest in this and you want to be able to test these with your samples is that there's a mechanism for doing that. Um, and uh, what we would recommend that you do is that you can contact Cytodiva at, at info at Cytodiva.com is the easiest way to do that. And then we can have a discussion about how we might want to do that to help you maybe better understand if there's utility for the instrument with, with uh, your research and that sort of thing. So. With that, we want to close, and, and uh, I'll ask my colleague Stuart to, to come over and maybe help me here, and we'll see if we have questions that, that, we, um, that we need to uh, be able to answer. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, let's see here. Can you here's, – here's a question that we have. Can you foresee whether a specific type of nanoparticle will be detected by enhanced dark field – for example, via the refractive index and or size of the material, we have trouble with quartz and some carbon-based uh, nanoparticles. So it's a good question. There is the capability to see qualitatively some size differences, either based on the structure or if there's enough size difference in the scatter that, that can be detected. Uh, however, we wouldn't say that as an imaging technique, that it's a, it's, a, it's a quantitative measurement tool for nanoparticles, whether it's dynamic light scattering or SEM, which are TEM, which we consider to be the ultimate tool for sizing nanoparticles. Those are really more quantitative in, nat uh, in nature. However, there is the ability to qualitatively observe differences uh, in, the, in the spectrum 
or excuse me, in the image when we're looking at different types of nanoparticles uh, that are in the field of view that you're looking at. Um, and that's very uh, sample dependent as to what we're able to do. Okay. All right. And that's the only question that we have so far. So um, we uh, want to thank you very much for attending this morning. And again, if you have questions and would like to reach out to us individually, the easiest way to do that is just to send a, an email to info at cyviva.com and uh, uh, myself or a number of my colleagues will be glad to answer for you. And we have one more question that, that we're going to, uh, uh, to answer. And this is uh, a question that wants to know what's the limitation in depth that you can detect nanoparticle uptake? Um, so it depends on the sample. We can theoretically section through, you know, if you looked at the cell that we were looking at earlier, that cell had many microns of focal depth to it. And so, um, you know, maybe as many as, as uh, 10, 20 microns of, of focal depth. Um, it's sample dependent. More dense tissue samples provide a limited capability because of the scatter intensity. Uh, but it's, it, there's a potential to effectively go through maybe as much as 20 microns of sample depth, maybe on tissue, to be able to look at nanoparticles in, in, uh, at different focal depths. Um, and, and we can actually illustrate that better with the 3D capability that we mentioned uh, earlier. And I think that 3D capability is something that we're going to feature next in, in, in a webinar that we do, and so, and so we'll do that. So hopefully uh, that answered your question. There was one other question that says, is the, su is, is the technique suitable for living tissues? Um, so there is a live cell imaging capability where um, with the Syndivo chip that we can use um, to be able to do live cell imaging right on the microscope, where you could take a cell or cell um, structures and you could actually uh, uh, take nanoparticles and introduce nanoparticles into a live cell structure and in real time watch that interaction and watch that uptake and actually capture those on video and capture hyperspectral images at different stages. So there is a live cell imaging uh, capability that, that's available on that. Now, living tissue would, would be a, a different story. I, I, I don't know that living tissue would, would be, itself would be, would be an actual option. So let's see, we have one more question. Is, would it be possible to determine aggregation states of nanoparticles as nanoparticles travel intracellularly, the number of nanoparticle changes. So it, clearly, if we have plasmonic nanoparticles, where we where aggregation or size of nanoparticles cause a shift in the optical spectrum. So, for example, if you look at gold nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles, there's a redshift based on size changes and aggregation equals size changes. So there's an ability to see those nanoparticles as they aggregate at the plasmonic level and spectrally measure that. If we look at aggregation or disbursement of nanoparticles that may not be plasmonic, that's gonna be more qualitative in nature. So for example, uh, if we map polymeric nanoparticles uh, in a cell, for example, we're going to map larger and smaller areas of those polymeric nanoparticles in cellular tissue. And so you'll be able to qualitatively see that. And we have a particle uh, uh, analysis feature of our software, which will provide you, uh, you know, quantitative information on what we're able to determine to, to that degree. But we're not going to be able to say that we have this many nanoparticles that are 50 nanometers for sure. And we have this many nanopart 50 nanometer particles that have doubled in size, right? Uh, it's not going to give you uh, quantitative information from that perspective. But the qualitative insight about being able to identify and map nanoparticles in the image is quite strong and, and, um, and, and very compelling. So one of the questions is, what was the approximate cost of the instrument? Great question. So um, if you look at an instrument that's equipped to do dark field, 
uh, optics with an optical camera and a hyperspectral imaging system as it was out there for what we showed you today, we would say that the cost of that system is going to be about $140,000 US. That's installation and training, software, computers, uh, turnkey. So that answers that question. Okay. All right. So let's see. We I don't think we have uh, any other questions here. Um, we got to thank. That's good. We want to take the time to thank you guys. Um, you know, everybody around the planet that's listening to this this morning is we're going through some pretty extraordinary times. Um, and um, so it, we're experiencing it here as well as you are. Um, and it's really science is going to solve this problem. It already is solving this problem. And, uh, and so we just want to acknowledge that. We want to acknowledge and thank you very much for coming on this morning. Uh, and uh, we will uh, have some other webinars that will be out on some different topics here later. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your attention. Uh, and we'll talk to you soon again. Thank you very much.